post 9-11, post Boston, are we any closer to understanding terrorists? Are their motivations political or personal? Next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. What makes a terrorist a terrorist? Except for the truly psychotic, it appears they have to be made, not born. We can almost understand individuals enlisting to fight what they see as political or religious repression. But what turns a Boston high school kid into a bomber? Counterterrorism researcher Bernard Fennell thinks it often comes down to a personal crisis that can make an individual actually eager to be manipulated. He is an associate professor of national security at the National War College in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show, Bernard. Thank you for having me. You have been immersed in terrorism studies for years. Take us into the mind of a terrorist in a very general way. What, what, what makes a terrorist? Well, that's a tough question because most of what uh, we think about causing terrorism are these macro phenomenons, big things, uh, poverty, um, the American foreign policy, um, ideology, things which affect millions and millions of people. And yet, if you look at the number of terrorists out there, people actually go ahead and use violence, kill innocent people, it's a very small number of people. And so trying to, to explain sort of micro phenomena, right, phenomena involving a, a small number of people using these big, broad trends is analytically dif difficult. I mean, by, by the logic of the situation, if ideology were the big problem, you should see millions of people fighting in, in groups like Al-Qaeda instead of the hundreds that you actually see in real life. So it strikes me that uh, the logic of that suggests that fundamentally it's about some sort of personality crisis. You're talking about people who have certain kinds of emotional needs, who very often have seen some sort of a, of a breakdown in the way that their lives are, are running. You know, you often see, um, for especially in, 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 the, for in Western countries where you see people being self-radicalized, that often comes as a consequence of failed relationships, uh, bankruptcies, job losses, uh, losses of, of personal uh, family members, parents, and other things that uh, disrupt the, the daily lives and patterns that people have built up and then make them vulnerable to um, this kind of extremist behavior. Mm -hmm. Would politically violent groups have the capacity to absorb millions of people? No, and I think that's one, one thing we need to keep in mind is that this isn't a, a mass movement. And if you look at the people who become members of various uh, radical Islamist groups in particular, it's often a very close-knit community. It's uh, people who are uh, joining the group because their uncle is, is a member or, or their brother um, or there's a, some sort of a long-term family connection. You very often see neighborhood clusters where you'll see a, a very small neighborhood will produce five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, people who join the movement. That's because they all know each other. They're working the same circles. And very often that's what makes it very difficult for us to, uh, to engage in counterterrorism because penetrating these groups is very, very difficult because it's not some sort of a mass recruitment. It's a very targeted personality, relationship-based kind of, of, of situation. Mm -hmm. And so um, there, there probably are um, out there millions of people who might be willing under the right circumstances to join a terrorist organization, but the terrorist groups don't have the capacity or frankly the interest in trying to bring in that many people. That just doesn't serve their purposes either. Mm -hmm. He used to write a very useful annual publication called Are We Winning, which gave a lot of us insights into where we were relative to the, the terrorists and the struggle or what used to be called the, the war. Are we getting better at assessing terrorist capabilities or, or worse? Well, you know, what's interesting is that, um, you know, the farther we get away from 9-11, um, the, the more difficult it is to get sufficient resources to actually keep track of the problem. We still spend a great deal, of course, on counterterrorism activities. The intelligence community is, is dramatically larger than it was before 9-11. But a lot of the public resources have sort of diminished. Uh, the government used to put out a, 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 a real-time database, um, the Worldwide Incident Tracking System, published by the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, that no longer is being updated for budgetary reasons. And similarly, if you look at funding from private foundations um, to do this kind of research, it's also diminished to a certain extent. People have, I guess, terrorism fatigue. And so um, it's, it's surprising, but over the last three or four years, I'd say the resources available to independent terrorist, terrorism researchers 
to actually get us into the trends, in particular the aggregate trends, has diminished significantly. Is it going to take another 9-11 type catastrophe to remind us that this type of research is not just interesting but essential? Um, well, it, it may, uh, but you know, hopefully you know, that's not the kind of trade-off that, that's certainly worth it by any stretch of the imagination. You know, we do have a, an ability to, to make some judgments, right, in the sense that there are certain kinds of attacks that we're really concerned about and there's that we're much less concerned about. And that's always been one of the challenges because when you look at sort of the broad terrorism databases, they capture all kinds of things uh, from you know, an assassination of a minor provincial official somewhere in Afghanistan to a major attack in a western city. And these are very different animals in terms of the threat they pose to the United States in particular, to our way of life, um, and to our allies. And so if we're looking at tracking sort of the big events, those are pretty visible. You can see them anyway. Um, you can sort of aggregate, aggregate them individually. And from that, we do have an ability to make a judgment that perhaps al-Qaeda's capacity to wage these kind of attacks, launch attacks against hard targets in Western, in Western cities and Western countries seems to have diminished. At the very least, we're not seeing very many of these attacks. But what we don't have is a sense of what is the overall health of the Islamist movement uh, broadly. I mean, um, you know, the size of the insurgencies uh, that are operating now increasingly in, say, West Africa and in the Maghreb region. That's the kind of data which would be sort of interesting to say, have a sense about the baseline, about how much activity is out there. And that's a bit, being a little harder to get a handle on. We, we seem to find the, the presence of these organizations and many of the revolutions that are taking place in the Arab world. Um, has the Arab Spring been useful for these organizations as far as getting into the conversation, or has it caused more disruption than benefit? That's a hard question uh, to answer. I think part of the answer has, has to be we'll, we'll see um, over a period of time, because in part it's going to depend on what the Arab Spring turns into in terms of political change. Does it, do we end up with just more repression? Um, do we end up with broken states? Or do we end up over a period of time with some sort of democratic um, uh, systems emerging that are stable, that reflect popular will? And that as a consequence of, of that, perhaps are less corrupt, more prone to economic growth and opportunity. All those kinds of things would be good long-term benefits, uh, certainly. In the short run, though, what we've seen in various places um, is a breakdown of the state security apparatus. And in fact, state security apparatus in many Arab countries, even though it was authoritarian, was also anti-Islamist um, and anti-Al-Qaeda type groups. And so there is clearly an opening that's emerged, and you see it most clearly in places like, like Libya and uh, Syria, where uh, under the guise of, of you know, first a regime change and now in Syria a civil war, we've seen a sort of dramatic uptake in uh, the activities of radical Al-Qaeda affiliate or Al-Qaeda inspired kind of movements and groups. Let's go back to the, the threat issue. After 9-11, everyone seemed to be keen on analyzing the threat, uh, keeping abreast of developments in other countries, trying to understand more than ever what was going on around the world. Are, are we at risk of lulling ourselves into a false sense of security again, into thinking that the threat has diminished to the point that we no longer need to worry about it? Now, the challenge w w with measuring the threat is that um, you're talking about a very small number of events, and they're very devastating um, when they do occur. I mean, 9-11, of course, you know, shapes in many ways our foreign policy for a decade. It shapes the way we still interact with our government. It's dramatically changed our notions of privacy domestically. Um, it, it plays a role every single day in our lives, so to this day. Tremendous impact of a single event, 19 men with box cutters. and. Making the connection between between those two and saying, well, is it worth it? Are we spending too much or too little? That's really a, a very difficult question to, to, to judge. It's possible to argue that, that we aren't paying enough attention to the potential threat for, of a, a group from outside attacking us at home. On the other hand, one could also argue that even after 13 years, we're still spending so many more resources. We still have such a large counterterrorism kind of presence training at local organization, uh, local law enforcement are focused on this much more than they were before 9-11. The intel community is much larger and much more focused on these issues. But anyway, that the point is that we may already, even if we were to lull a little bit and become less focused on it, we may already still be over-investing in counterterrorism at home uh, by some metrics. These self-radicalized individuals, do you see that as uh, a growing threat in the United States? 
Uh, well, again, it's, it's, it's one of these things which is hard because you're talking about a very small number of people, but the, any time that they end up acting, mm -hmm. it's inherently devastating. And so it's, it's, is it a growing threat? Um, I don't know. Um, is it a threat? A absolutely. And it's a threat which, which is just very, very hard to get a handle on because as a practical matter, self reactalization is, is relatively easy. You get some sort of a, of a life crisis. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, a, a broken marriage, a bankruptcy, a lost job, um, and suddenly, you know, people who were on fringes um, become more radicalized. They become, you know, they, they begin to look for reasons and, and justifications and um, meaning for their lives. And there's tons of material out there. It's not as if there are active, many active Al-Qaeda recruiters in neighborhoods and communities, but all you have to do is go online and find plenty of resources that are going to explain, well, it wasn't really your fault. Um, you know, your marriage broke down because of, you know, Western, uh, the breakdown of Western values that made it impossible to have a, a marriage. Your, mar your uh, life is falling apart because of some sort of predatory structure of the American government. Anyway, there's, there's lots of, of things which are excused, explain away the problems that people have. And so it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a problem, but I'm not sure it's a problem that's any larger than any other problem that you see domestically. We've seen a, a number of, of incidents of gun violence, uh, mass shootings, and so on. Um, I'm not sure that we, there's any particular reason to treat those as sort of fundamentally different from a public policy or in some ways a public health kind of, of perspective. How do developments such as 9-11 or the, the use of drones against terrorists in uh, Southeast Asia, South and Southeast Asia, how, how do those play into the making of terrorists? There's clearly a demonstration effect. And uh, you know, you see, do see a, an uptick in, in terrorist uh, recruitment and activities whenever you see an, an attack. A successful attack always makes other people think, well, we could do that too. We could accomplish that as well. And so you get that kind of demonstration effect um, and copycats, frankly, is, is what's going on in many cases. The, the bigger issue, in, in, I think, regarding 9-11 is the issue of, of transnational networks, where you have some sort of a, a command and control structure, where there is someone, a bin Laden, for example, who's staying there and actually allocating resources, uh, bring people together to train them, authorizing plots, um, calling upon resources from a variety of parts of the world, and using them in a very targeted manner. I think in some ways we've seen um, a, a reduction in that, simply because those networks are harder to maintain in a much more hostile counterterrorism environment, where the United States is paying much more attention, using a lot of, of, of state resources to track and monitor the activities of potential terrorists, but then also using targeted killings to kill large numbers of them. And while any one terrorist, of course, is replaceable, uh, every time one of them dies, it, 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 it makes things a little more difficult to form. It breaks down that, that, that network that, that was built up around that person, the personal relationships that were so important to making that organization function, that cell function, fray. Um, it in, in induces these organizations to be much more paranoid, much more cautious. They can't use the same kind of communications networks that they were in the past. They have to rely on face-to-face -face meetings, which again makes them easier to track in some ways. Couriers, which makes it harder for them to, tra to, to communicate across borders. It just makes it harder for them to be able to, to pull all their plots together, which I think is one reason why what we've seen over the past several years has been increasing fragmentation of Al-Qaeda, where there is no longer really, as far as I can tell, an al-Qaeda central that's able to actually um, uh, issue binding orders and make plots actually uh, come to fruition. Instead, what seems is every once in a while you get um, a, a captured message that becomes public, like the one that, that caused our embassies to shut down um, earlier this year, um, that, that make it seem as if there's, there was an order given from al-Qaeda central to attack. And you realize, well, nothing happens. Why has nothing happened? Because they're pushing on a string. They have actually no command and control. That said, um, what that means is that you have lots of, of local organizations, smaller groups, that are now sort of free agents. And as free agents, they're competing with each other for resources, for prestige. They want to be the top dog, say, in the Maghreb. They want to be the top dog, say, in, in West Africa or East Africa. And so it creates a, a dangerous dynamic where these organizations are trying to, to prove that they are you know, the true representative of the movement. But they're more likely to be a threat in a particular country or a region than to the entire world. Exactly, and that's why we're seeing a lot of this going on where 
Uh, you're seeing localized attacks, and you know people will point out, um, for example, the attack on on the Benghazi consulate as being a, a sign of of the resilience and, and capacity of Al Qaeda. In some ways, it, it is, or Al Qaeda inspired groups. But you're still talking about at that point a couple of dozen men with small arms um, attacking an isolated, poorly defended outpost of American power. That's a far cry from a 9-11 style plot where you have cells operating in Hamburg, in Jakarta, um, they're in Florida, they're in New York, they're, they're coordinating multiple planes, they have uh, bank accounts where $500,000-ish of money are, are, are flowing around, they're renting apartments. It's very different to gather two dozen of, of, your, of your armed buddies um, and go attack an isolated spot. And I think that's what we're seeing more of. Now, it's very dangerous when people happen to be there. And because the United States has global interests and our, our corporations have global interests, um, it does mean that there are Western targets, Western diplomats, um, means that there are Western businessmen, um, Western workers, um, and and variety of other people who are very much at risk. And for them, um, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's just as bad a problem. If you are if you are working in an oil field in Libya and you get attacked or kidnapped, for you, for your family, that's, uh, that, that's as bad as if you were um, killed at the finish line of the Boston Marathon or anywhere else. What, what is your assessment of how politically violent groups view the United States? There was a time when those groups used to, I think, misinterpret the capabilities and likely response of the United States to, uh, to terrorist attacks, but it seems that we've really gotten their attention with the use of drones. The drones seem to be something that disturb and intimidate them more so than past efforts. Well, it's, it's, it's persistent and it can happen any time. And I, I think certainly, you know, I, I, there's, there's always been this debate over whether we were attacked on 9-11 because we were seen as being weak, right? That we failed to respond in the past, that we tempted aggression by failing to be sufficiently uh, proactive in our responses to terrorism. The counter argument, of course, is that if you actually ask, um, you know, the people who are in jihadist organizations, why do you hate America? They don't say it's because you're, we're weak. They always say, well, it's because you're, you're an octopus. You're mm -hmm. too strong. You're constantly getting involved in our lives. You're propping up regimes. You are um, leading to oppression in our countries. You're too involved. That said, I think um, at the very least, there was always a sense that uh, American responses would be punctuated, right? That there might be a, a U.S. retaliation for some sort of, of, of act of violence, but it would be sort of predictable. There would be a buildup, an announcement. It would happen. Then you have to weather the storm for a period of time, and then it would end, and you go back to your original plotting. And I think that was easier for those organizations to deal with, as opposed to sort of what we're seeing nowadays, which is that it's this sort of grinding, pervasive, continual threat that they feel that they're under, and are in fact under. So there's certainly some benefits to that, but by the same token, this sort of persistent American response, the fact that at any moment um, a drone might launch a, a missile, drop a bomb, um, on a target or that special forces might arrive and shoot up a house, that creates also this sense of pervasive insecurity. And if you look at the public opinion polls um, in places like Pakistan, Yemen, elsewhere, people will say that that is one of the major reasons that they are anti-American, that they resent American power, American influence, American behavior. So I, it's very hard to disentangle that. People don't like it. Uh, um, it's not clear how much of an effect it has on macro public opinion. Uh, clearly it, it serves to uh, discourage at least some kinds of behavior and organizations, so organizational functions by terrorist organizations. But by the same token, um, it may also sort of justify their existence because they say, look, after all, we're constantly under attack. How can you deny us our right to self-defense? Do you feel that communities in the United States are adequately prepared to deal with politically violent acts? We had the case of the Boston Marathon, but does it vary from city to city or in general, whether it's Boston, Orlando, Los Angeles, Chicago, are we better able to deal with these threats than we were before 9-11? I, I think so, and, and you've seen much better training of first responders, you know, people who are, you know, much more sort of awareness of a chemical, biological kind of, of threats so that you don't get uh, the, the potential of mass casualties. You're able to contain those kind of threats much more quickly. Um, almost all major police departments have counterterrorism squads. They're liaising quite closely with the federal government. I'd say the one thing about preparation, though, is that uh, in some ways there's been a, um, a strange allocation of resources. And this is the nature of our, of our governmental system, our federal system, is that the minute that there's a program, everybody wants a piece of the pie. And so, you know, you have many, many towns in the United States which have been able to acquire 
uh, various kinds of, of counterterrorism funding, which probably aren't on anyone's uh, most likely, most hundred most likely terrorist targets, you know, and so it's there's, there's almost certainly um, a misallocation of resources as well. Where um, for many years, almost anybody who wanted to get a federal grant to do something, whatever it was, would slap the label counterterrorism or or domestic preparedness on it, and as a result, get funding um, for programs which may or may not, in fact, contribute to an overall public safety um, because they just don't deal with where the threats really exist. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go back to something you referenced earlier. We were talking about research not being as readily a available on the subject as, as before. It, is, is that putting us at a disadvantage? And to the extent that some of this is caused by budgetary problems and government openings and closings, um, are, are we really shooting ourselves in the foot? I think certainly we are in sort of a, a macro sense. I mean, th there's no question that our, all of our budget squabbles um, have, because of, because of how, how disorganized they are, you know, about you get sequester going on um, and you know, across the board cuts. There's there's no strategy. There's no there's no real weighing of where resources ought to go. And I think certainly that's um, a major problem that we as a nation face. I don't think it's it's limited, however, to the counterterrorism field. I think that you know this is one of the problems that we are dealing with as a country, where this lack of consensus on how to go forward about. Uh, spending in general and taxes in general um, leads to um, a lot of, of, of irrationalities of various sorts. So I think you know the biggest value to an informed public and to access to a fair amount of research was always to be able to say, hey, um, we don't just need to take the word of, of the administration of power um, in, in office at the time as definitive. We can hold them to some more objective standards. And as a result, we can try to depoliticize judgments about whether ter counterterrorism measures are effective or not. The less research there is available, the less public debate there is available, the more tempting it is going to be for any given administration to spin um, recent results in politically convenient ways. And there'll be no ability for the media, for independent scholars, for the public in general to hold them accountable and say, well, hold on a minute. If what you're saying is true, then how come X, Y, or Z has occurred? At least one explanation for 9-11 was that the terrorists perceived us to be strong. Mm -hmm. Do you think they still perceive us to be strong as we go through this period of indecision, ineffectiveness, uh, et cetera, et cetera? You know, you're talking about radicals, right, who are living in their own little bubble. Um, they, uh, they rely upon their, their, their own self or their own news sources. Um, they're very insular. And so, you know, what they think at any given time may not really be reflective of, you know, there the, are the, the people who very often are, are, are very tied into various conspiracy theories. So, you know, how the world actually is operating and how they perceive it to be operating are often at quite at, at odds. And so I'm always sort of skeptical about people who say, well, you know, our, but our federal, our, our governmental shutdown, that, uh, that sent us a signal that, a signal that we're not credible, that we're weak to the terrorism. You know, these guys think that they are living day to day for God's will, and you know they're not really their their narratives, right? The stories they tell about us and about themselves are pretty consistent, and they're not really that much affected by day to day events. They're going to take whatever we do um, as an indicator that supports their their, their pre existing preferences and positions. So you know, you're right. If the government shuts down, they'll say, "Ha! We showed them the Americans are weak. Our strategy is successful." If we didn't shut down, but instead expanded our, our activities, became you know, more uh, uh, effective in, in launching more attacks, say, ha, see, the Americans were running scared, and now they're using more violence against us. No matter what we do, they're going to spin it in a way that, that, that says they were right all, the whole time, and they need to keep the, of the struggle. That's the way their, their mental map is, is working. Well, thank you very much, Bernard Fennell, for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It was always a pleasure. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.